start sir we are live uh good evening friends welcome to the 81st webinar of the pg track program of delhi csi and uh, today we are going to continue with our earlier topic of interpretation of exercise in cardiovascular disease with none other than professor v s narayan sir as you know that in first term uh, first uh, session he very nicely described nuances what what are the diagnostic ways what are the basic uh, interpretations of the x ray how do you approach interpreting an x ray in a cardiovascular disease so today we are going into the part 2 of the same session so it will be a continuum of the same and i have with me along on this journey dr girish mp who is a professor of cardiology and uh, dr safal who is a associate professor of cardiology both in gp and hospital and our colleagues dr nitish naik and sumit korean so uh, welcome to you sir thank you so much for agreeing and mm-hmm. thank you and uh, over to you sir please to start the session thank thanks you, very much uh, can i share my screen now sure sir so is my screen visible no not yet sir not yet kya hua शेयर स्क्रीन क्यों नहीं हो रही है शेयर स्क्रीन शेयर यस नाउ इट इज कमिंग सर या हियर इट इज नाउ अच्छा ठीक है यस यस सर तो हम थैंक यू वेरी मच एंड लेट्स कंटिन्यू विद व्हाट वेयर वी लेफ्ट ऑफ लास्ट टाइम एंड वी हैड कवर्ड द एट्रियम एंड द पल्मोनरी आर्टरी हाइपरटेंशन एंड द वेनस हाइपरटेंशन पार्ट so just quickly you know it's everybody knows this but it's good to revise things at times so <clears throat> the criteria for left ventricular enlargement uh, generally you don't need <clears throat> to comment in the ap view or the pa view ap view will of course will be showing a falsely enlarged heart but in the pa view generally you should not try to comment on it and try to look for the lateral view but in the ap view the features that <laughs> point to left ventricular enlargement is of course the rounding of the apex the cardiophrenic angle is obtuse the long axis of the lv is elongated and points to the left and downwards and the apex goes below the diaphragm so these are the four features in the uh, the pa view but it is generally the <laughs> lateral view where we take the different criteria the two regular measurements and one eiler ratio and we'll look at them one by one so when you have <clears throat> an enlargement of the left ventricle in the lateral view this posterior space is the space where the left ventricle will expand so it moves towards the spine and when it moves towards the spine it overlaps the inferior vena cava here and this distance is is important and we shall look as to how this can be measured and the criteria can be reached so basically when the left ventricle you know moves in the posterior direction to this space it overlaps the ivc and when it is grossly enlarged it goes and sits over the spine so the whole of the posterior space get becomes obliterated and it starts sitting on the spine even in the lateral view so this is broadly how the left ventricle will enlarge now the criteria is that you look at the ivc border and you see how much of the left ventricle moves out of this border and you take 0.2 cm from where the ivc starts from the diaphragm and from there you drop a perpendicular onto the outermost point of the left ventricle and this distance d <coughs> generally is less than 1.7 but if it goes more than 1.7 that the enlargement is significantly posteriorly this is the sign a regular sign a for left ventricular enlargement this is the left border of the lv this is the ivc and this is how you take a measurement then you have the regular b and we will see what the regular b is when you take the lateral view the point where the ivc cuts the left ventricle that distance is taken this distance is the distance which you measure and normally <laughs> this is more than 4.5 7.5 but if it goes less then it is a sign or regular sign b for left ventricular enlargement so look at this distance 
This is for regulus B. The left ventricle will enlarge posteriorly, and the more it enlarges, the lesser will be this distance from the diaphragm up to the point where the IVC cuts the left ventricle. So normally, this distance becomes reduced when the left ventricle enlarges posteriorly. And this distance B gets reduced because of this enlargement posteriorly. And the criteria is that this distance normally, which is more than 7.5, gets less than 7.5. And this is taken as regular B criteria for left ventricle enlargement. So this was regular A. You take a point two centimeters from where the IVC starts from the diaphragm and drop a perpendicular on the posterior border of the left ventricle. And this distance A should be more than 17 millimeters. Normally, it is less than 17 millimeters. So more than 17 here and less than 7 point here. Regulars A and B. These are, you know, sometimes the examiners can ask you, basically, I would say that you simply say that the left ventricle overlaps the IVC, goes past it, and fills up the posterior space. And this is how you broadly diagnose left ventricular enlargement. Now, when you cannot see the IVC, there are times when you cannot see the IVC, you take the Eilers ratio. And what is this ratio? You take a point A, that is the inner border of the midsternum, and you take point B, which is the posterior part of the left ventricle. And then you take another point C, which is the posterior spine. So AB upon BC should normally be <clears throat> about 0.42 ratio. Now, what happens when there is enlargement of the left ventricle posteriorly? When the left ventricle enlarges posteriorly, the point B moves posteriorly. So this point B moves posteriorly. The AB distance becomes more. The BC distance becomes less. And this ratio goes more than 0 0.42. So this is the criteria. This is the Eilers criteria for diagnosing left ventricle enlargement. So sometimes the examiner can ask you as to what the Eilers ratio is and what is the regulars A and B points are. RV enlargement is simpler to diagnose. You simply take the cost of free cardiophrenic angle in the APV, PA view and you find that instead of obtuse, it is acute. And you take the lateral view and you have an obliteration of the retrosternal space. So when you look at the retrosternal space, space, the lower one third is formed by the right ventricle. The upper is formed by the right atrium. So normally, the, you should have this space over here. But even if the space is obliterated by some kind of RV enlargement, this enlargement should be categorized as RV enlargement only when two-thirds of the distance of the maneuverum sternae is covered by the right. So how much of the retrospinal space should be obliterated? How much of the sternum should be touched by the right ventricle to be called RV enlargement? Two-thirds of the sternum. The upper part is from the right atrium, and one of the criteria for right atrium is when this upper part of the retrosternal space is obliterated. So one of the criteria of right atrial enlargement, and we shall subsume that, is also obliteration of the upper part of the retrosternal space. But the, for the criteria for RV is touching of the sternum, obliteration of the retrosternal space, and two-thirds of the entire region, just from the <coughs> maneuverium sternum down, should be in touch with the right ventricle to be called a right ventricle. RA enlargement, when you have more than five centimeters of right atrial enlargement from the mid sternal line, that is in adults. In children, it is four centimeters. Then, how much of the right atrium should be occupying the right border? More than 50% of the right border should be occupied by the right atrium to be called right atrial enlargement, and then you can count the intercostal spaces. And if the right atrium is occupying more than two and a half or two, three intercostal spaces, so these are the three criteria for right atrial enlargement. And the fourth criteria is when you take a lateral view and you find that this upper part of the retrosternal space is obliterated. So these are the criteria for right atrial enlargement. Now coming to the ascending aorta, normally the right border up here is straight. Here you have the superior vena cava, then you have the azygos, and then you have the right ventricle. And right <coughs> ventricle 
this area generally they are not seen. You just have a straight border over here. The SVC can become prominent. The zygos can become prominent. The right atrium can become prominent, and then the aorta can also come and become prominent. You start seeing it on the right border. The aortic knob is 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 see shown to be prominent when you have this criteria. And what is that criteria? You take the lateral border of the tracheal aerogram and you measure the distance from here to the outer border of the aorta. And normally, this distance should be less than 35 millimeters. In this case, this distance is 40 millimeters or 42 millimeters. And therefore, it is a clearly prominent aortic norm. If you take a very penetrated view, The descending aorta. But here the criteria for prominent aortic knob is measure the distance from the outer border of the tracheal aerogram and you measure this distance should be more than 35 to be called a prominent aortic knob. This is a very classical x-ray for ascending aorta prominence and this is a case of bicuspid aortic valve. Generally in aortic regurgitation you may or may not get an ascending aorta dilatation in rheumatic aortic stenosis, you may not get an ascending aorta dilatation, but in bicuspid aortic valve, where you have an intrinsic abnormality of the aortic wall, you will get this kind of ascending aorta dilatation. And you have rounding of the left ventricle, which is also you know, a pencil lined left, uh, <coughs> left ventricular shadow because of left ventricular hypertrophy. So whenever you have left ventricular hypertrophy, this shadow this salute becomes more sharply defined becomes rounded and more sharply defined so this is a case of bicuspid so this is is often brought in the examination classic bicuspid aortic now this is another x-ray where you find that the aortic knob is prominent and there is an indentation over here and then you have another dilatation and this is classical coarctation of aorta the upper knob is formed by the dilated subclavian artery or the proximal dilated aorta. This part, of course, is the constriction and the lower <coughs> part is formed by the post-stenotic dilatation. So subclavian artery or aorta or both constriction and then post. So this is also often exam it is also an examination question as to what forms this three side. So this is the three side. And then you look for nib notching and we'll see more of it. So this is the classic three sign. You see this three sign, two knobs and a constriction. And when you take an indentation on the barium male esophagus, you find this classical reversal of three, that is the E sign. So this is the three sign, and this is the E sign, and this is the angiogram showing you the constriction of the aorta. Classic, you know, ribs notching, the posterior ribs get notched, and the inferior borders of the ribs are the areas where you will see notching. This is another example of notching, very classical rib notching on the inferior surface of the posterior ribs. And what is the differential diagnosis often asked in the examination? Besides coarctation, it could be Takayashu arthritis, it could be a classic BT shunt, could be chronic supina vena cava obstruction, intercostal AV fistulas, and even neurofibromatosis as the causes of, and then you can also have unilateral and bilateral and things like that. So you can go ahead and go back and read about it. But this is the classic X-ray picture of rib notching, and these are some of the common causes of rib notching. And rib notching occurs because of the dilated intercostal vessels. The flow of blood is from the <coughs> subclavian, from the intermammary arteries into the intercostals. So these are the dilated intercostal vessels. This is the internal memory and the question often asked in the examination and this is also another view where you see that these are the ribs and on the posterior borders of the inferior borders of the posterior ribs you find these dilated intercostal vessels so the flow of blood is from the subclavian to the internal memory to the intercostals down to the post stenotic aorta now the question asked is 
that why do you get uh, rib notching only from the third rib downwards and not in the first two ribs? And the answer is that if you look at this intercostal vessel, it is a connection between the internal mammary and a branch of the costal cervical trunk, which is above, which is both of these are above the constriction. The constriction is here. The second rib also the communication between the thyrocostal cervical trunk and the internal mammary, and they are both above the constriction. It is only the third rib downwards that you will have a communication which is above to below the constriction. So only when you have the communication and anastomosis from above to below the constriction will you have prominence of the intercostal vessels. So the answer is that the first two intercostal vessels run in the ribs and these intercostal vessels do not communicate between the proximal and the distal um, <coughs> parts of the coaptation um, co 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 of aorta, but with the thyrocervical trunk, which is both of them being prominent because of the uh, proximal part of the constriction. So unless you have a communication from the proximal to the distal and in constriction in between, you will not have prominence. So the first two ribs are not lost because the first two intercostal arteries do not communicate with the <clears throat> intercostal vessels, which are parts of branches of the post aortic aorta. They are branches of the costal cervical trunk. Now, sometimes you know you get you know these unusual type of X-rays, and this is a classical X-ray which we used to do in our times when the echo was not available. You <clears throat> drain the pericardial fluid, and you push in some air and start looking at the thickening of the pericardium. So one of the methodologies of measuring the thickness of the pericardium was to drain the fluid and inject some air into it. So air is injected and you can measure the pericardial thickness. This is also a curiosity of you know past decades, long time ago when there was no treatment for tuberculosis, the antibiotics were not available. So the affected parts of the lung were made to collapse by using foreign material and Hippocrates was the first one who used it 2,400 years ago by using a pig bladder. But this was the usual treatment of tuberculosis before 1950s after which we got streptomycin. So collapsing of the affected lung using foreign material, you know, whatever material you want to use and Hippocrates used you know, pig bladder to do that. Now, sometimes <clears throat> when you look at an X-ray, you know, and you see this shadow, double shadow, immediately you start thinking of a left atrial enlargement. There is some lifting of the left bronchus also, but there is no left atrial appendage. So what is the differential diagnosis of this shadow over here? We look at the posterior view, this is the area of the left atrium, but you have a shadow sitting here instead of a shadow sitting in the region of the atrium. So this doesn't look like atrium, at least in the lateral. And as a curiosity, this is an aneurysm of the left circumflex artery, which can manifest as a shadow, you know, which can mimic the left atrium. So this is a curiosity. I just thought that I would share this extra with you. This is an aneurysm of the left circumflex artery, which this is the, the MR of the, the CT of the same case. See this aneurysm of the circumflex, the aneurysm of the circumflex, which manifests as if it is a left atrial enlargement, but it is not so in the lateral view. Similarly, you can have something here also. And what is this? This could again be an aneurysm of the coronary artery. It looks like a pulmonary artery, but it is not the pulmonary artery. It is also an aneurysm of the coronary artery, that is the circumflex artery. Similarly, what looks like a right atrium here could also be a aneurysm of the right coronary artery, as you see over here, is the right coronary artery, and you see a big aneurysm. The right coronary artery, big aneurysm of the coronary artery, manifests as right atrial enlargement. So I'm not saying that you go ahead and start diagnosing right atrial uh, prominences as aneurysm, but this somebody you know keeps on asking you what else can it be, what else can it be. You can say that this could be a curiosity, could be a rarity. You can have aneurysms of the coronary arteries 
which can look like right atrium and left atrium enlargement. This, of course, <clears throat> is another situation where there's some enlargement, and this is a pericardial cyst. And this pericardial cyst is compressing the right ventricle. Let's let's keep you know keep going and not indulge in these things. So one last curiosity: this is a heart and heart situation. This is the cardiac salute, and within the cardiac salute, you find there's another heart sitting here. So heart within a heart, and when you did a beery meal, you found that this was a event ration of the of the gut it gone through the diaphragm and sitting in that area. So this is basically the shadow of the gut. And when you gulp, this looked like a mass in the echo, but when you took some aerated drink, that mass tended to disappear. So this is event ration of the gut through the diaphragm and looks like a heart and heart situation. So curiosity is just to give you a comic break. Another comic break, when you get an X-ray like this, it means that somebody has proposed uh, to his girlfriend. And uh, one common method of proposing is to put the ring into the wine glass, but the poor fellow put it in a glass of milk. The girlfriend did not see that ring sitting in the milk and ran the whole thing. And so this ring went into the stomach. So just a comic break, nothing over here. So let's get on to congenital heart disease. We've just a quick uh, revision that you, the right side aortic arch is diagnosed by looking at the indentation on the trachea. The side of the indentation is the side of the arch and the shifting to the opposite side is the is, is one of the criteria. Here again, look at this. You see an indentation on the left side. The tracheal indentation is on the left side. So this is a left-sided aortic arch. Right-sided aortic arch, once again, if you look at the indentation over here, this is a right-sided aortic arch. So don't go by this shadow, go by this indentation. Sometimes, you know, you're right that this is a right-sided aortic arch, but in the examination, don't say that you see this on this side. That is why you're saying it is a right-sided arch. Say that I am looking at the indentation on the right side, and therefore I say it is a right-sided aortic arch. Now, at times, you can't say the indentation is either this side or that side. And sometimes in a very clear X-ray, you can see that the indentation is on both sides. And when you have indentation on the both sides, then this could be a situation of a double aortic arch, the right and the left. And you see this on the on this <clears throat> view, you see that the trachea as well as the esophagus are, you know, <clears throat> being surrounded by a double aortic arch, the right as well as the left. And you can have a lot of striders and difficulty in speaking. So double aortic arch, when you see indentation on either side, on both sides of the trachea. This we've already said, told you that the criteria for prominence aortic knob is when you measure on from the lateral side of the tracheogram to the outside and it should be more than 35. Now, quick revision of the mal, mal positions which we saw last time, the bronchial situs, of course, everybody knows that the right-sided bronchus is short and straight and the left one is long and curved. The right side bronchus originates superior to the pulmonary artery and therefore it is called aparterial. And this is the, it, it originates inferior than left one, so it is known as hepaterial. So a hepaterial bronchus is left-sided. I had last time told you that hep is lower down, so anything which is lower down is leftward. And aparterial is above, so right is above, always correct, so it is aparterial. So aparterial is the right bronchus and hepaterial is the left bronchus. When you have situs solitus with levocardia, it is a normal heart. If you have dextrocardia and in addition you have sister situs inverses, that is the gas bubble on the right and the liver on the left, it is a total reversal and you have a mirror image dextrocardia. Once again, you have a normal anatomy most of the situations. Now, if you have a dextrocardia, but the situs is solitus, there is no reversal of the the, the, the visceral uh, viscera, this is isolated dextrocardia and it is generally associated with complex congenital heart disease. Now, if you have levocardia, in levocardia, you expect the gas bubble to be here, be here, but here you find that the gas bubble has gone to the right side. So, this is visceral inverses with situs, which, which is with this levocardia, and this is also isolated levocardia associated with complex congenital heart disease. 
So viral damage dextrocardia, generally no heart disease. Isolated dextrocardia, isolated levocardia, generally associated with complex CST. This is a situation of dextrocardia, but when you look for visceral situs, you find that the liver is sitting in the center and the gas bubble is also somewhere in the center. So this is basically a situs ambiguous. You can't say whether this is right or left. So this could be either both sided right or both sided left. That is left isomerism or right isomerism. Similarly, the heart is in the center. The apex is neither this side or that side, but the liver is in the center. So once again, a situs ambiguous situation. Now, <clears throat> you have a new bond with cyanosis and tachypnea. You look at them, this is the thymus, and this is a classic sale sign of the thymus, which we shall discuss. So new bond with cyanosis and tachypnea. And when you looked at the, the MR, you found that the both the bronchi are short and broad. So bilateral right-sidedness or right isomerism. You find that the IVC and the aorta both are on the right side. So right-sided isomerism is associated generally with a screenia situation and we'll see that. This is, if you look at the tracheogram and the bronchogram, you find that both these bronchi are long and thin. So they are bilateral left sided so this is left isomer both the bronchi are left so <clears throat> what we saw there was first we saw that with right isomerism both the bronchi were short and broad generally it is associated with no spleen a splenia situation both these situations will be complex congenital heart disease so right sided isomerism abdominal heterotaxy the liver is sitting in the center. The gas bubble is sitting in the center. This is heterotaxy with asplenia. And generally, there is no spleen. On the other hand, if you have bilateral left-sidedness, this is generally associated with polysplenia. That is lots of spleens. Small spleens are there. Heterotaxy, the liver is in the center. The stomach is also in the center. But in these situations, most of the cases, one liver lobe would be bigger than the other. So this is polysplenia left isomerism and one common feature of left isomerism is interruption of the IVC and continuation as a zygous connection which goes and drains into the SVC or the right atrium. So basically one, you know, sometimes you would be asked what heterotaxy is when you have the liver center sitting in the center, stomach in the center. What is bilateral right-sidedness? Both the bronchi are right-sided. Generally associated with severe pulmonic stenosis with asplenia situations. Generally, lots of screens, interruption of the IVC, isogus connection with bilateral left-sidedness. The liver is central, but one of the lobes can be bigger. And the commonest conditions here are generally L-transposition of the great vessels. Here, there is D-transposition, severe pulmonic stone situation. Any type of complex cardiac uh, um, uh, heart disease can occur, but these are the common things. So one should familiarize himself or herself with what heterotaxy generally means and what are the conditions that generally occur. So let's start with, you know, in half an hour, let me just sort of run you through as to what is the methodology. And generally what I say is that whenever you are given an X-ray of the congenital heart, start your interpretation for, for, for any cardiac X-ray, start by looking at the main pulmonary artery area. And you find that the main pulmonary artery segment is absent, then you are probably dealing with a tetralogy like situation, tetralogy physiology, and then tetralogy physiology is most likely to be tetralogy of cell. If, on the other hand, you find that the main pulmonary artery segment is prominent, then this could be either a pulmonic stenosis situation or it could be pulmonary arterial hypertension situation. Then the next step is to look for the right pulmonary artery. And if you find that the right pulmonary artery is prominent, this is a case of pulmonary arterial hypertension. If the right pulmonary artery is absent, then it is most likely to be a situation of pulmonic stenosis. So these are the two steps that you need to see. As I said, if you look at the right pulmonary artery and if the right pulmonary artery segment is absent, this looks like a case of pulmonic stenosis. But if the right pulmonary artery is prominent in association with main pulmonary artery prominences, it is a situation of pulmonary 
arterial hypertension. So another example of valvular pulmonic stenosis, main pulmonary artery segment is prominent, could be PS or PH, but the right pulmonary artery is not prominent. So this is a situation of PS, valvular pulmonic stenosis because the main pulmonary artery segment is prominent. Just a moment, I'll, I'll show you. Was everybody shouting from there? Sorry about that. So this is an angiogram just to show you that in severe pulmonary stenosis, the main pulmonary artery segment would be prominent, but the right pulmonary artery is diminutive. Here you see a diminutive pulmonary artery. Could be also a peripheral pulmonic stenosis situation over it. In contrast, in pulmonary artery hypertension, you have a main pulmonary artery which is prominent, and the right pulmonary artery is also quite prominent and well formed, in fact, more prominent. And we will see the criteria for prominence of the right pulmonary artery. You measure the right pulmonary artery, and it should be more than 17 millimeters in males and 16, 14 to 16 millimeters in females. If you cannot measure it, then compare it with the trachea. And if it is more than trachea and diameter, then it's a, a dilated right pulmonary artery. Now, what about this? This is a case of cardiomegaly. The main pulmonary artery segment is prominent. So this could be PS or PAH. And there is no main right pulmonary artery over here. So this is most likely a situation of pulmonic stenosis. So main pulmonary artery segment is prominent and you have a cardiomegaly. Now, when you have cardiomegaly in a case of pulmonic stenosis, then always ask whether the patient is cyanosed or not cyanosed. And if the patient is cyanosed with cardiomegaly and main pulmonary artery segment, this is a case of triology of fallow where you have valvular pulmonic stenosis and intact ventricular septum with reversal occurring across the interatal septum. Now, could there be anything else when you will have cardiomegaly and cyanosis? The answer is yes. Cardiomegaly with cyanosis, but the main pulmonary artery segment is not there. So the main pulmonary artery segment is not there. You have cardiomegaly with cyanosis. This is classical Epstein's anomaly where you have reduced pulmonary blood flow because of functional pulmonic stenosis, because of a dysfunctional right ventricle the flow to the lungs is, is reduced and therefore you have functional pulmonic stenosis. So cyanosis with cardiomegaly, main pulmonary artery segment prominent, triology of fellow, cardiomegaly with cyanosis, no main pulmonary artery segment, blood flow reduced, it is Epstein's anomaly. Now if you have cyanosis without cardiomegaly, then it is Eisenmenger. But within Eisenmenger, the ASD part gives you cardiomegaly because of tricuspid regurgitation. So ISD Eisenmenger can also give rise to cardiomegaly with cyanosis. So the differential diagnosis for cyanosis with cardiomegaly, triology of fallow, Epstein's anomaly, and ASD Eisenmenger. Eisenmenger VSD, Eisenmenger PDA generally do not give rise to uh, cardiomegaly. But cardiomegaly is there with ASD Eisenmenger because of the prominent right atrium. So main pulmonary artery segment prominent, main pulmonary artery segment absent. This is what we have just said. If you have cyanosis with no significant cardiomegaly, then this is likely to be Eisenmenger, except, of course, for ASD Eisenmenger, where you have cardiomegaly because of right atrium. And this is a classic jug, jug handle uh, X-ray of an Eisenmenger situation, and we will discuss Eisenmenger subsequently. So let us go straight away to discussing Eisenmenger. These are the three Eisenmenger situations commonly. If you have no aorta prominence over here, and you have aorta prominence in another X-ray, the one with the aorta prominence is a case of PD Eisenmenger. No cardiomegaly here, Cardiomegaly here without an aorta prominence and a gross enlargement of the main pulmonary artery. This is ASD Eisenmenger. So cardiomegaly, no aorta 
Eisen Menger ASD. No cardiomegaly, aorta present is PD Eisen Menger. No cardiomegaly, no aorta, VSD Eisen Menger. So is that clear? Any aorta, no cardiomegaly, PD Eisen Menger. No aorta, cardiomegaly, Eisen Menger ASD. No aorta, no cardiomegaly is VSD Eisen Menger in a very simple term. So when we talk of shunts, we've already said that you look at the blood flow in the three lung fields. And if you can see vasculature right up to the last lung field, it is increased for the blood flow. And then you see end on vessels, the number has to be more than five in both lung fields, or more than three lung fields. This is another example of, you know, use end, see your end on vessels, increased pulmonary blood flow. And then you compare the artery with the bronchus. And if the artery diameter is more than that of the bronchus, it is increased pulmonary blood flow situation. Auto pulmonary window, or even a large coronary AV fistula. Generally, the AV fistula are small. You don't get very much of signs on the X-ray. But if it is a large AV fistula, then of course you can get. But within the three, presence of aorta is PDA. If there is no aorta, it is either ASD or PAPVC or VSD, and the signs we've already discussed. ASD classical no aorta is absence of conflict because of the shunt is predicuspid. Large main pulmonary artery, large right pulmonary artery, large right atrium, and end on vessels. AV canal defects, which are part of ASD, VSD, mitral regurgitation, tricuspid regurgitation, depends upon what is more prominent. You can have signs of heart failure because of severe mitral regurgitation. Because of a large VSD, SD, you will have signs of pulmonary pithora. You will have cardiomegaly, and then, so you will have both venous as well as arterial uh, presence on the lung fields, you will have cardiomegaly, and depending upon you know the pulmonary artery hypertension, you will have so in all sorts of you know x ray pictures will be seen in an AV canal defect. When there is partial anomalous pulmonary venous connection, instead of a straight border over here, you will find that the SVC is prominent. So the FCV SVC prominent, a disproportionate SVC dilatation can make you. <coughs> suspicious of the diagnosis of a partial anomalous pulmonary venous connection. When we talk of pulmonary venous connection, this is a curiosity which is often brought in the examination. This is a classical Schmitta syndrome, where one of the, the pulmonary veins on the one of the lungs, especially the left side or the right side of the lung goes and drains below the diaphragm into the inferior vena cava. Another example, this is a classic shadow of, these are two classic shadows of Schmitta's syndrome. Another Ashmitar, everybody knows, is the Turkish sword. And this is the vein which is going down and draining into the another example of Shmitars. And this is the common vein which is going down below the diaphragm and draining into the IVC. Another example, pulmonary vein goes down and drains into the IVC. So this is the Shmitar syndrome, where you cannot forget that this shadow is because of the vein from the lungs in the left side and lung and you can have so many signs in the lungs also you can have atelectasis you can have um, um, bronchitis you can have atasia i mean all sorts of lung changes can occur and besides asd and drainage of the pulmonary vein below the diaphragm there are other you know long list of other abnormalities which you can get in shmita but commonly it is asd Commonly, it is drainage of the pulmonary vein below the IVC, below the diaphragm into the IVC, and lung changes. <clears throat> we've talked about ASD. Now, coming to VSD, we've said there is no, no aortic prominence. But here, you have not gone into Eisenmenger, so there is still some cardiomegaly. But the main part is that you have left atrium and left ventricular enlargement. And you have end-on vessels, so increased pulmonary blood flow, LA. LV, but no aorta. Had there been aorta, we would have thought of PDA. But absence of aorta, LA, LV, increased pulmonary blood flow is a ventricular septal defect. On the other hand, if you look at the PDA, once again, increased pulmonary blood flow, and you will have a prominence of the aorta. And if you look closely, you can have calcification of the 
duct seen here, the so called railroad track calcification of the duct. Then <coughs> ascending aorta dilatation, and it goes on to say that filling of the angle between the aortic arch and RA is the most specific sign of pulmonary uh, of, of, of a PDA. Now, what is that region called? That is called the aortopulmonary window. The small indentation, the concavity between the aorta and the pulmonary artery is known as the aortopulmonary window. And the aortopulmonary window tends to the aortopulmonary window tends to get obliterated in aortopulmonary window defects. So this obliteration, filling up of the angle, also a sign of a duct, and this is the region where you see for calcification, the so-called railroad calcification, which we just talked about. So dilatation of the pulmonary arteries and filling up of the space between the aorta and the pulmonary artery, the aortopulmonary window, and of course, the prominence of the aorta, both ascending aorta as well as the descending aorta, in addition to increased pulmonary blood flow, is a sign of PDA. Another example of PDA, aorta prominent, main pulmonary artery prominent, increased pulmonary blood flow, PDA. So this is, once again, all three together, ASD, VSD, PDA. Main pulmonary artery prominence in all three, aorta prominence in PDA, right atrial prominence in ASD, left atrial prominence, left ventricular prominence in VSD, absence of aorta in both ASD as well as VSD. This is a jug handle picture of Eisenmenger syndrome. But this is what we've already discussed. What about the truncus? The truncus also gives a very classic picture. You see this dilated aorta, the trunk, and you have situations where you will have, you know, a superior position of the pulmonary artery. The right pulmonary artery takes a superior position, and this hilum, elevated hilum, is known as the waterfall sign. The left pulmonary artery, which is arising from the truncus, gives an inverted hyler comma sign. So these are the two signs that are often you know, asked in the examination. This is the high takeoff, that is the elevated right hilum, and this is known as the waterfall sign. And the right, the left pulmonary artery branch gives a comma sign. So you have the waterfall sign and you have the hyler comma sign. And of course, largely associated with the right-sided aortic arch, seen by an indentation on the right part of the tracheogram. And the PA segment generally will be absent. There will be no prominence because the pulmonary artery, main pulmonary artery is absent because the pulmonary arteries are arising from the aorta. So this is the trunk and the trunk is giving rise to the pulmonary artery. So the main pulmonary artery segment will be absent, but the right and left pulmonary arteries will be seen. There will be increased pulmonary blood flow because most of the truncus presents as increased pulmonary blood flow. It is only the truncus type 4 which presents like pulmonary atresia. But so it will give signs like waterfall sign and the comma sign. And in association, you will have the left ventricle, but main pulmonary artery segment will be absent. And you will have evidences of increased pulmonary blood flow. AP window, we've said that this is this groove between the pulmonary artery and the aortic knob, and this is known as the <coughs> pulmonary groove, which is a concave groove, and it generally fills up when you have a defect, and it fills up. This AP window tends to get filled up, and this is how it looks. You know, at times that you will have some dilatation of the suddenly the truncus, then you will have filling up of the area between the aorta and the pulmonary artery, the so-called aortopulmonary window. So this is again another situation where this aortopulmonary window is filled up. This is the defect, and they often asked as to how the catheter moves. So the catheter and aortopulmonary window goes from the pulmonary artery and turns to the, uh, to the right and goes into the ascending aorta. In contrast, when you have a PDA, it goes to the pulmonary artery and through the PDA, it goes into the descending aorta and gives you the hairpin loop. So you don't get a hairpin loop in a autopulmonary window. This is the autopulmonary window. This is the communication here. When you go from the pulmonary artery, it goes and sits into the aorta. And you can go from the pulmonary artery into the aorta and deliver your device and close off the autopulmonary window. 
If it's a large auto foundry window, sometimes even an ESD device is required to close it. One of the largest left to right shafts will be seen with the auto pulmonary windows. So, auto pulmonary window filling up of the angle between the aorta and the pulmonary artery, the auto pulmonary sulcus. What about aortic dissection? We will look at the two signs of aortic dissection widening of the mediastinum and the calcium sign. You see a widening of the, of the, of the mediastinum. You will have a depression of the left bronchus. You will have an apical cap. The, the, the cap here, you will have some pleural effusion and you will have a separation of the paratracheal stripe. So let us look at it one by one. So widening of the, of the mediastinum is common. Now the aortic knob, which is normally here, is obliterated because of dissection. So the obliteration of the aortic knob is there. Then this is a calcium sign. You find that the calcium is outside inside and the vessel wall is outside. And this distance is generally considered prominent when it is more than five. Some books write it is more than 10. So this is the calcium sign where you have separation in the vessel wall, in the aortic wall. And this distance generally is more than five millimeters to call it a calcium sign. And then you have this apical pleural cap. So lots of signs are seen. And then this, this is the paratracheal line, which also becomes widened. So paratracheal line becoming where prominent, mediastinum becoming wider, the calcium sign, the depression of the left bronchus and the apical cap, all these things you can get in a case of aortic dissection. This is the right peritoneal stripe and this peristernal stripe is obliterated and widened when you have an aortic dissection. Cyanotic heart disease, we have about 15 minutes, so we'll rush through with cyanotic heart disease. This is a classic picture of uh, a tetralogy physiology where you have no cardiomegaly, where you have no main pulmonary artery segment, and you have reduced pulmonary blood flow. So these are the three classic features of tetralogy physiology. And the five TDS within tetralogy physiology are tetralogy of fallow, retransposition of gate vessels, L-transposition of gate vessels, tricuspid atresia, double outer right ventricle, and single ventricle. So all these are the five Ts and TDS, five TDS within tetralogy physiology, which simply means that you have severe PS with a large ventricular septal defect. And the X-ray features which are common are main pulmonary artery segment absent, no cardiomegaly, and reduced pulmonary blood flow. Now, in contrast to, uh, and then when you have severe, severe uh, pulmonary stenosis or goes to the level of atresia, you will have a lot of collaterals. Now, pulmonary atresia, instead of the heart being normal size, you will have some enlargement of the heart biventricular conformation, a large aorta, generally a right-sided aortic arch, and because of collateral circulation, you can have a rib notching also. So this is an X-ray, which is a severe tetralogy, or let us say, permeatresia situation. And this is a right-sided aortic arch, which is common with. The more PS you have in tetralogy going towards atresia, the more chances of you know, having a right-sided aortic arch are there. When you have in tetralogy physiology or pulmonary this kind of reticular pattern, this is basically collaterals, which you are seeing here. You know, it looks like a cavitation, but it is not a cavity. It is generally a collateral circulation. Now, just a quick revision of what this collateral circulation is. Now, the systemic collateral arteries could be three. One is one which accompanies the bronchial vessels. The other is could be directly coming out from the aorta, and the third one would be coming out from one of the branches of the aorta. So type one is the bronchial, which is coming from the bronchial arteries, which are supplying basically the bronchus, but give branches into the lungs also. So these are the bronchial arteries, type one systemic collateral arteries. Coming directly from the aorta are type two, and coming from the branches of the aorta is type three. Now, where do they communicate? The type 1, which is bronchial, goes directly intrapulmonary. 
So bronchioles go directly into the intrapulmonary arteries. What about those which come out directly? That is type 2. They go and communicate with the hilar branches. And the ones which are coming out to the type 3, which are branches of the branches, generally go and enter into the pulmonary artery, but they are extrapulmonary. So the two extrapulmonaries are the hilar as well as the, uh, the branches of the pulmonary artery. And basically, they are coming directly from the aorta or from the branches of the aorta. And the ones which are intrapulmonary are the ones which are coming out from the bronchial arteries. So one should remember the two types of the three types of systemic collateral arteries. And when you catheterize a patient of pathology, you selectively want to uh, catheterize the collaterals, the, the, the major aortopulmonary collaterals, or you can take a aortic, aortogram and identify the different and the question often asked is, why do you want to identify them? Because you want to obliterate them prior to surgery, because otherwise the surgeon will be in a mess. Because once the patient goes on a cardiopulmonary arrest, cardiac arrest, then the LV will continue to receive blood through the collaterals and the patient and the doctor will be in trouble in operating. So another, another view of how the collaterals look like, this looks like you know, a bad lung, but in fact, this is collaterals. Is a collateral supply directly from the aorta to the segment of the lung. So this collateral picture is also very classical, seen at times with pathology of fallow of the severe variety or the pulmonary trees. Bronchial collaterals, of course, they have a very specific pattern. They will come come out from between T5 and T6, and these are how these are. Uh, this is how they look like. These are these are bronchial arteries which are basically supplying the bronchus, but then they give branches to the lungs also inside the lung tissue that is intrapulmonary and bronchocollaterals are localized by uh, the CT and the MRI. Tetralogy of fallow, classic boot shaped. This is how it looks like on the echo and this can be identified in the fetus also. If you have a cyanotic child and this is the type of picture which you see on the X-ray, this is classic tetralogy of fallow. But on the other hand, if you have a presentation like tetralogy of fellow, but instead of a right ventricle, you find that the ventricle is left-sided, then start thinking of something else, and that something else is tricuspid atresia. So if you have absent main pulmonary artery, no cardiomegaly, but instead of the right atrium, right ventricle, you have a left ventricle. This is tricuspid atresia. And when you have tricuspid atresia, you find that this region is straightened out. And this straightening is basically because of two reasons. One is that you have a diminutive right ventricle. And the second is that the atrial appendage has been juxtaposed. So juxtaposition of the atrial appendage as well as the diminutive right ventricle gives to this straight border, which is often seen with tricuspid atresia. But a left ventricle in tricuspid atresia is what we're looking at in contrast to the right ventricle with tetralogy of fallow. Now, sometimes in order to sort of fool you, the examiner will give you this X-ray and immediately you will say that this is a case of tetralogy of fellow. Why? Because the main pulmonary artery segment is not there. The apex looks like right ventricle and there is no cardiomegaly. But then immediately ask whether the patient is cyanosed or not cyanosed. And the moment the patient, the, doc, the examiner tells you that there is no cyanosis but heart failure, immediately look at the region of the aorta and look for the three signs. And then go to look at the periphery, look at the inferior margin of the posterior ribs. So three sign, and the, so this looks like tetralogy of fellow, but there is no cyanosis, but CHF. So this is a case of coaptation of aorta, three sign, and inferior ribs, the inferior margin of the posterior ribs. Now, can this be tetralogy of fellow? The answer is if the presentation is like tetralogy of fellow then of course it cannot be. But if the presentation is with a lot of respiratory distress and strider, then the answer is yes, it can be. And this is the classic book picture of the <clears throat> absent pulmonary value in association with tetralogy of fellow. And these are the prominent main pulmonary artery segment, right and left pulmonary artery, the so-called Mickey Mouse sign, which goes and compresses the lungs, causes it to be collapsed. And when there is collapse, then respiratory distress starts occur. So tetralogy of fellow with pulmonary valve can give rise to this picture. And the clinical picture is that of 
cyanosis with respiratory distress. Cyanosis with respiratory distress is the type of presentation which you will get in a patient of tetralogy with absent pulmonary valve. Uh, absent, and look at what is happening here because the pulmonary valves are the right pulmonary artery and the left pulmonary artery are so enlarged that they will press over the bronchi. And when they press over the bronchi, they cause a lot of pneumothorax, they cause a lot of respiratory distress. So basically, when you have this kind of picture and it's asked in the examination, ask whether the patient, if the presentation is, is that of you know, classic tetralogy or that of respiratory distress, and it says respiratory distress, say, yes, it could be absent pulmonary valve with tetralogy in the Mickey Mouse sign. And this is how why it happens. Dilated main pulmonary RP and LP causes compression of the newborn with respiratory distress. Congenital absence of the right pulmonary artery can also present like this. And the third presentation, respiratory distress cyanosis, could be because of muconium aspirations, because of air blocks. You can have pneumothorax, you can have you know, interstitial changes, you can have airspace obliterations. So the three things which can present commonly with, you know, a newborn respiratory distress, one is absent pulmonary valve tetralogy of fellow, the other is you know, because of uh, absence of the right and left pulmonary arteries, and it could be muconium aspiration. Of course, you can have HLS also and highland membration disease also. So we should be aware of, you know, all the possibilities. Sometimes the examiner becomes happy with just your initial diagnosis. Sometimes he wants to go further and judge you whether you thought of everything or not. What about this? This is not another Mickey Mouse. This is a patient who has a continuous murmur. And when you have a continuous murmur, you know this is classical figure of eight with the snowman sign. So this is a snowman sign, total dominance for venous correction where all the veins join to form a vertical vein, which goes and joins the innominate vein and which drains into the superior vena cava. This is a supracardiac variety, which gives rise to a figure of it. The infracardiac variety is, presents differently. So this is all the veins joined to form the vertical vein, goes innominate veins, goes and drains into the SPC, and then the right atrium. And this is the angiogram, and this is the figure of it, which you see on the normal X-ray. So <clears throat> another figure of it. So not all the time will you get a very classical picture. Another uh, name for a figure of it is the cottage loaf. And sometimes people even call it a snowman in a snowstorm. Snowman because of the figure of it and snowstorm because of increased pulmonary blood flow. So this is figure of it. This is a snowman. And if you look at the periphery, it is Prothoric end on blood vessels because of increased pulmonary blood flow. So, snowman in a snowstorm. Now, supracardic as well as infracardic can get obstructed. Supracardic can get obstructed where the vertical vein gets compressed between the bronchus and the dilating pulmonary. When you have this kind of obstruction, it causes pulmonary venous and then pulmonary artery hypertension, which leads to further dilatation of the pulmonary artery and further compression of this vertical vein between the bronchus and the, and the pulmonary artery. So this vicious cycle goes on and you can have severe pulmonary venous and pulmonary artery hypertension when this, this vein gets obstructed. On the other hand, the vein which is going down below the diaphragm to drain either in the IVC or in the portal vein, it will get obstructed at the diaphragm. And if it is draining into the portal vein, of course, it will get have an obstruction in the circulation within the airway. So hepatic drainage will cause pulmonary artery hypertension for sure, and even in the diaphragm level when there is compression. So this is obstructive total normless pulmonary venous connection, both in the supracardic variety as well as the infracardic variety. And if you have this this type of hazy picture where you don't see much of cardiomegaly, but you see a lot of hepatomegaly, the differential diagnosis becomes total numbness for venous connection of the obstructed variety. Total numbness for venous. And this is a question somebody asked in my last lecture as to what is the difference between island membrane disease and this 
very difficult for me to answer. Sometimes it becomes very difficult. And if somebody knows the answer, I'll be very happy to know. But the differential lioness, of course, is highlight membrane disease. That also presents like a ground glass X-ray appearance. And the third thing which presents like this is the hypoplastic left heart syndrome. Here they have described that the hypoplastic left heart syndrome can be differentiated from you know, TAPVC by the absence of LV and the prominence of the right atrium. So the right atrium is prominence and the LV is absent, then they can think of HSLS. So the three situations which can present like this, I line sort of, you know, ground glass or haze in the X-ray, HSLS, high line membrane disease, and total numbers, peribinous connection of the obstructed variety. Uh, do we have time for more? Yes, sir, please continue. Now, uh, cyanosis is birth. If the, this is another situation, interesting situation, where you have cyanosis since birth and you start thinking that this patient could be tetralogy of fellow. Now, tenderly tetralogy of fellow will present with cyanosis at about three to six months of age, not at birth. So the moment somebody says cyanosis since birth, think of transposition physiology. And the transposition physiology, instead of, you know, in, in contrast to, to tetralogy physiology, has three things. One is it will show some cardiomegaly. In tetralogy physiology, we had said that there will be no cardiomegaly. Then, instead of reduced pulmonary blood flow, there will be increased pulmonary blood flow. The main pulmonary artery segment will be absent, but there will be narrow pedicle. So narrow pedicle, increased pulmonary blood flow, and cardiomegaly are the features of a transposition situation, the transposition of great vessels. And the reason for a narrow, narrow pedicle is that the pulmonary artery and the aorta are sitting anterior or posterior to each other, and then the thymus shadow is absent. When you have cyanosis in birth, the thymus is absent. So the absence of thymus and the anterior position, posterior position of the great vessels gives rise to this narrow pedicle. So this is what it looks like, narrow pedicle and the egg on side. The RV is connected to the aorta, the LV is connected to the pulmonary artery, transposition of great vessels, and an egg hanging by the string or narrow pedicle and egg on side. This is some of the things which are wrong. Now, talking of the thymus, generally the thymus will to produce two signs. One is the sail sign, and the other is the is the wave sign. So, this is what the thymus looks like: sail sign, and this this is another sail sign. The thymus there, sail sign, and this is the wave sign where you see wavy. So this is the thymus is not the main pulmonary artery. So if your patient is, uh, is a newborn and shows these two signs, the <coughs> sail sign and the wave sign, this is the thymic shadow. Sometimes the thymus can even show this kind of shadow, which is unusual, but sometimes you can come across and see it. This is another example of transposition, cardiomegaly, narrow pedicle, and increased pulmonary blood flow. You can see and not vessels over here. So the difference between tetralogy, increased flow, decreased flow, main pulmonary artery segment absent in both situations. The pedicle is narrow here, it is not so narrow here. And it's a classic uh, upturned right ventricular apex. The right ventricle is, is, is upturned. The, the classic boot shape is because of right ventricular enlargement, hypertrophy, as well as the intraventricular septum instead of being, you know, you know uh, downwards is lifted upwards, so it becomes horizontal. So once the interventricular septum becomes horizontal and the right ventricular hypertrophy occurs, it lifts the apex up, and you have that classic boot shaped or a core sabo uh, appearance. So basically, increased pulmonary blood flow and decreased pulmonary blood flow, and a narrow pedicle will differentiate transposition. If you look at the echo, this is the normal circle and sausage appearance which is absent in transposition, you will see two circles instead of this circle and social appearance. If the aortic valve is on the right and anterior, it is <coughs> in, in transposition, generally it is on the right anterior, it is detransposition. If the aortic valve is to the left and anterior, 
it is l transposition so basically very very basic so you have two circles aortic valve on the left side anterior left likely to be l transposition on the right and anterior likely to be d transposition sometimes you know this x ray is often brought and you find this kind of shadow is there this kind of shadows over there so start thinking of a modified bt shunt where you have a communication you have a of a conduit between the subclavian and the pulmonary artery and this is you know a block and a narrowed conduit which is dilated and stented this is another you know conduit to show that this is basically a bt shunt bt shunt where you don't have a conduit this is a direct this is the classic bt where the the subclavian artery is cut and you know put into the uh, pulmonary artery and uh, this is the classic bt and the modified bt is of course using a conduit so you don't need to cut the subclavian and you, you can regulate the blood flow also you will prevent from kinking also you can use either side of the subclavian you don't need to go to the side opposite the the arch so lots of, of advantages with the modified bt shunt so be prepared to answer those questions also in the examination and this is a the aneurysm of the bt uh, of the bt shunt is an aneurysm so some of the curiosities which i thought this is a cmr where you have an rv giving rise to the aorta the lb giving rise to the pulmonary artery this is transposition of great vessels the angio shows a trabeculated right ventricle giving rise to the aorta a smooth ventricle giving rise to the pulmonary artery there is some pulmonary artery banding also done over here tetralogy will give rise to both the vessels in the rao view and this is narrowing also of the aortic of the pulmonary valve so some valvular as well as valvular pulmonic stenosis is present both the great vessels are filling from this now if you have a tetralogy physiology like situation no cardiomegaly reduce pulmonary blood flow but you were looking for an empty bay over here so instead of an empty bay you find that there is something prominent sitting here so don't think of this being a pulmonary artery don't think of this being an absent pulmonary valve giving rise to mickey mouse because you don't see a dilated pulmonary and the presentation of course is also not a restricted distance so this is the left sided aorta which we talked about so instead of the convexity you have a, instead of a concavity you have a convexity all other signs of tetralogy being there no cardiomegaly reduced pulmonary blood flow think of l transposition of great vessels the right ventricle giving rise to the aorta which is on to the left side so ascending aorta this is the shadow of the ascending aorta so this is a classical x ray picture of l transposition of the great vessels the trabeculated great the ventricle giving rise to the left sided aorta and this is the classic um, the angio of the of the l transposition where you have a septum sitting vertically the septum is is sitting vertically like this you see the septum here the left ventricle gives rise to the aorta and the right ventricle will the the left ventricle goes through this this communication and goes to fill the aorta but the aorta is basically connected to to the right ventricle so you have two wrongs to make a right but this is just to show that the septum in l transposition sits here and this is also to show this is often asked in the examination as to whether the catheters will cross or not i don't think it is going to be asked anymore but this was something which we were asked in our times that in l transposition you do not have a crossing of the venous as well as the arterial so you have an aortic you have an aortic catheter goes through the aorta into the right ventricle and you have a venous catheter going into the left ventricle and these two catheters generally will not cross while they would in a case of normal situation or in tetralogy a venous catheter going through the pulmonary artery going into the lungs the arterial catheter going through the aorta and going into the ventricle the right ventricle once again and these two catheters are crossing so these two catheters when they don't cross it is l transposition when they cross it is d transposition septal activation another so what do we say there is so much more but uh, we don't have time for it do we 
Uh, you can, sir, continue with some important one. That's fine, sir, because we won't be having another session on that. So very happy to have the x-rays and this thing and completion. I think my <laughs> colleagues, Girish and Sapul would also agree to that. So it's yes. a very nice, great learning. Yeah, please. So and I'll just take another 10 minutes and then... I'll... Please go ahead, sir. So my narrow pedicle egg on side, what do we say? Does it look like... Does, does it look like uh, detransposition because you have a narrow pedicle, you have cardiomegaly, and you have something which looks like an egg on site. But look for pulmonary blood flow. The third most important feature of transposition was increased pulmonary blood flow, which you do not find over here. So if you have cyanosis and you have something looking like an egg on site, but there is no increased pulmonary blood flow, think of Epstein's anomaly. So Epstein's anomaly has to be differentiated from, so looks classical for DTG, narrow pedicle, egg on side, but look at the pulmonary blood flow. So this is not transposition. Transposition will have increased pulmonary blood flow. So this is transposition. And these two are Epstein's anomaly variations. There, there is decreased pulmonary blood flow, the so-called functional pulmonic stenosis. Now, if you have an infant with this kind of cardiomegaly, there is no cyanosis. What are the situations that you can think of? Severe pulmonary stenosis. Severe valvular pulmonic stenosis can manifest like this. The, severe, the severity of pulmonary stenosis is so much that there is no blood flow into the pulmonary artery, and so there is no post-tenotic dilatation. In post-tenotic dilatation, you will have when your PS is not too severe and in adults. But if you have a severe PS in a newborn or an infant, then you do not get pulmonary uh, dilatation, main pulmonary artery dilatation, but you have cross cardiomegaly. And the differential diagnosis is Epstein's valvular PS with failure, rheumatic heart disease, tricuspid regurgitation, a large pericardial effusion, a dilated cardiomyopathy, endomyocardial fibrosis, and Olsen anomaly. So the differential diagnosis of Epstein's has to be kept in mind. This is once again, so box shape we have seen, and this box is predominantly because of the dilated RV outflow tract. So dilated RV outflow tract gives rise to, so one side of the box is because of the right atrium, but the right side, the left side of the box is made by the dilated outflow tract. And this is the MR, which looks like this. You have a displacement of the tricuspid valve, and then you have embolizations with abscesses in the brain in Epstein's anomaly. And this is the X-ray ECG of Epstein's anomaly when you have a fractured QRS complex on the ECG. And this is the last couple of slides before I finish off. What about this X-ray? Is this Epstein's anomaly? Could be but you should ask whether the patient is cyanosed or not cyanosed. And if the patient is not cyanosed, then this kind of Epstein's anomaly is basically, um, you know, it has to be differentiated from pericardial effusion. And one of the features of differentiating is look for pulmonary blood flow. In Epstein's anomaly, we had said the pulmonary blood flow is reduced when the blood flow is normal and you have this kind of massive cardiomegaly back shape. This is a large pericardial effusion, especially if there is no history of cyanosis. The CMR will show this kind of shadow. And when you look at the X-ray, you will the echo, you will have a large pericardial effusion on both sides. And the ECG shows a, a small voltage or low voltage complexes. If you have a very large uh, pericardial effusion and the heart is swinging into your pericardial sac, then this is the ECG which you get, the alternance. One of the complexes is big, the other is small. Even one is up and the other is down. So <clears throat> electrical alternance is something which you see with large pericardial illusions when you have the heart which is swinging inside your heart. Uh, large, uh, okay, so let, this is the last one which I wanted to show. Uh, absent pericardium. Absent pericardium, you have this aortic knuckle and then you have the main pulmonary artery. And this is the area where you have in, invagination of the lung tissue. So the lung tissue goes and sits between the aorta and the, 
pulmonary artery. And this is known as the Snoopy sign, that the lungs are snooping in between the aorta and the pulmonary artery. And if you look at the MR, you find that there is something which suggests a pulmonary embolism, which is not. It is basically because of the gross movement of the heart inside the pericardium, in, inside the, in the, in the thorax, that you have this churning effect and you have the Seeger and Ghosting sign. So this is an X-ray which suggests an absent mm -hmm. pericardium, the Snoopy sign and the Seeger sign. Sometimes when you have this kind of you know, shadows, then immediately start thinking of a situation of aortopulmonary AV fistula. And this is the angiogram which you see. When you have a diffuse uh, fistulae, uh, then you can't see very much on the X-ray. But uh, the diagnosis of an AV fistula, pulmonary AV fistula, is made by uh, you having cyanosis, but there are no physical signs as such. This two is also normal. So when you have cyanosis with a normal S2 and you have cyanosis, then you start thinking of two, three situations. One is direct communication, pulmonary artery into the left atrium, SPC draining into the left atrium, and then you have the situation of a pulmonary AV fistula. And that can be differentiated by giving injection, a contrast uh, injection with the air bubble injection from the arm and seeing whether there is appearance or not appearance in the left atrium. That is how you can differentiate between the pulmonary AV fistula and a direct communication between the pulmonary vein and the, and the left atrium. So I think um, um, we can stop here. And uh, if there's any questions, then we can take them. Uh, thank because you. Basically, you know, to differentiate between tetralogy of fallow, transposition D, transposition L and tricuspid is the classical X-ray pictures which were picked up from Dr. Rajan Tandon's book. And these are the classic ECGs. In tetralogy, you have right axis deviation, early appearance of S-wave, <laughs> transit transition, D-transposition, you have right axis and RVH. In tricuspid tresia, you have left axis and LVH. And in L-transposition, you have Q-wave sitting in 2, 3 and V1 and absent from V5, V6. So classic ECGs and classic X-rays of tetralogy physiology. Okay, so that is, that is all I think. And there are a lot of X-rays which I have removed because um, X-rays are uh, innumerable. There's so much available on the net also that you keep picking everything or something or the other every day. <laughs> Thank you, sir. It's a great lecture. I would invite Dr. Girish and Dr. Safal also to participate in any discussion and questions. So, I have just one comment. Uh, the enlargement of the right pulmonary artery, uh, you know, in the pH, as you showed, uh, when it is more than trachea, probably this is more uh, specific for the children rather than the adults, right? That's right. Probably that's this is generally used in more adults. That's uh, what yeah. I said. In adults, yeah. it is 16 or 17, but between 18. 14 and 16. But mm -hmm. in children, it is, um, you compare it with the trachea and trachea. the reduction in the size you see with the accompanying bronchus. So if, you're, if your main bronchus, the right or the left, you compare the pulmonary artery with that. On the right side, you will compare with the right bronchus. And if it is less than the right bronchus, it is reduced in size. Yeah. So increase in size with compared with trachea and reduction <laughs> compared with the bronchus. So from my side, it is just a beautiful collection and especially that clip of a swinging heart. <laughs> Such yeah. a fine swing is it's just beautiful. Any other yeah. question, Girish? Actually, it's an yeah. elaborate lecture and very nicely uh, summarized. Uh, huge collection of this. has been fantastic. Sir. Great. <laughs> That's uh, one of the uh, questions which has come, sir, uh, is the L transposition versus right-sided aortic arch. Mm -hmm. How to differentiate? I think uh, right sided aortic arch, you will see indentation on the trachea yeah. on the right side and the shifting of the trachea to the left side. And uh, <clears throat> the L transposition, of course, is in, in the convexity on the left border. Left side, yeah. You can confuse I think it, it with the main pulmonary artery. Yeah. But uh, there's hardly any you know confusion between a right sided aortic arch and the. Mm. Hmm. 
I think the question has to be, sir, uh, uh, deposed uh, versus with with uh, right side aortic arch. With the transposition with yes, right side aortic. Yeah. That might yes. be the uh, yeah, yeah, relevant question yeah, rather than this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very difficult yes. because you, know, you can't yeah. see the aorta. Yes. So because the aorta and the pulmonary artery are sitting in the right in the center. But <clears throat> the aorta is there anteriorly, so indentation will still be there. Yes. The pulmonary artery will go behind, but the aorta is right in front, so it will yes. cause an indentation on the trachea. But yes, it can become difficult at times. But I must say, beautiful collection, sir, and uh, uh, no, the way you presented also made it so simple and simple made and, us, yeah. uh, you know, understand the anatomical structures there. The beautiful, sir, beautiful. Thanks. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much, sir. Thank you okay. so much. Thanks a lot. Thank you, thank thank you Girish, thank you, Safal, and thank you everyone for joining. And in case you have any questions and comments, please write to us on uh, CSI uh, DB at. Uh, um, uh, gmail.com we will be happy to hear uh, from you this lecture will be available on YouTube uh, I've already posted the earlier one and please listen to it again because this is very very these two lectures are gold actually for your exams and for your past basic understanding so you know it takes a lot of effort for a phenomenal person like Dr. Ryan to put his whole experience 30-40 years of experience knitted down in two hours <laughs> so that is really itself a Herculean task so we are really grateful to you sir uh, from all the residents and all the uh, professors and also doctors also who have joined sir faculty thank you Intas for providing thank us this you. platform thank next you. week uh, we'll catch up again with another session please stay safe at this time and uh, take care of yourself and also your patients thank you and good night good night good night good night